Today, I'll be discussing Harappan uh, artifacts made from steatite, which is a massive form of the mineral talc. Uh, Harappans use this soft, easily carvable stone to create um, a wide variety of objects, uh, most notably the distinctive uh, seals and tablets, as well as beads, thousands hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of beads. Uh, the renowned bead scholar, uh, Horace Becht, uh, described the Indus as a steatite civilization. Steatite objects, he said, produced by Harappan craftspeople were remarkable, not only in their number and variety, but also in their extreme beauty and perfection of execution. Um, nowhere, here we go. Nowhere is this uh, more true than at Harappa itself, where my co-author Brad Chase and I worked under the direction of the Harappa Archaeological Research Project directors, uh, Mark Knoyer and Richard Meadow. Steatite artifacts have been recovered in abundance in every excavated area at this huge Indus city. Uh, they are, in fact, so numerous that they make up nearly 40% of the site's stone and metal artifact assemblage. A, uh, a large portion of this uh, sub-assemblage is raw, materi raw material debris, like the fragment shown here. Uh, these are, le these are pieces of steatite left over from the manufacture of beads and seals. Okay, um, it was the debris like that that I used to identify the geologic sources of Harappan steatite. And before I began that, I had to uh, collect geologic samples. And here is a picture of me from almost exactly 20 years ago, almost to the day, to the month at least, uh, me collecting uh, steatite, geologic steatite samples in um, Baluchistan. Over the course of several years, I managed to collect samples of steatite, here we go, uh, from over three dozen sources in every major region surrounding the Indus Valley. It took, uh, I took about 500, almost 500 of those samples to date, and I've compared them to 200 steatite debris fragments from Harappa and several other Indus, uh, into civilization cities and smaller uh, sites, not all of which are listed here. Comparisons were made using instrumental neutron activation analysis, which is a method that gives precise uh, elemental data on uh, solid objects. The results, uh, the results showed an extremely diverse uh, geologic data set, but one that was uh, when one in which sources could di be differentiated from each other. And the, uh, it was found that uh, uh, the Harappan artifacts, when plotted on top of them as read from the various sites, uh, could be matched to certain regions. Okay. And we discovered that uh, at Harappa and other sites throughout the Indus region, the large majority of raw steatite was acquired from sources located in what today is northern Pakistan. There were some, uh, there was some regional input, uh, like in uh, sources in Baluchistan and in Rajasthan, but by and large, the uh, steatite trade network ran from northern Pakistan through south throughout the Indus Valley. So what was uh, so special about steatite from North Pakistan? Experimental heating studies provided the answer to that. Um, uh, here's one being conducted by uh, Mark Knoyer and uh, Greg Jameson. Um, uh, we it was found that uh, Harappans used raw steatite that became white when heated to high temperatures. And if you look at Harappan steatite artifacts, seals, beads, they all have a, almost exclusively have a nice uh, light or white, bright uh, colored exterior. 
experimental studies of uh, geologic samples showed clearly only raw material from certain sources became white like this. And these sources tended to be located in northern Pakistan. So this was an informative study, but it was ultimately limited because raw steatite debris is not found at every end of site and certainly not in great abundance. What is found at every indecite are small white steatite beads. Uh, the Italian archaeologist Massimo Vidali has said that uh, white steatite beads, steatite beads themselves, are uh, practically an uh, indisputable marker of the Harappan character of an archaeological site. If you, white, if you find small white beads, you have something related to the Harappans. Uh, and they're, they're found in abundance. There's not a, I can't think of a single site at Harappan site at which they are not found. All right. Now, the, uh, this study began about five years ago. Uh, it was actually uh, suggested by uh, Dr. Chase uh, based on some earlier work that I've done and our collaborator, uh, Dr. Uh, Ajit, Ajit Prasad uh, from MSU. Um, we, at that time, we decided to do a new study of uh, just focusing on beets. The first issue we ran into was, was the uh, small size of the artifacts we're looking at. And you can see, there's actually my finger there. You can give you, kind of, here's a scale too, but you can kind of get an indication of how small these objects are, particularly the uh, micro beads uh, are sub millimeter sized objects, extremely, extremely small. Now, the problem with this is um, that uh, for optimal neutron activation analysis, at least at the lab uh, I'm working at in Madison, you need about 200 milligrams of sample, which in and of itself is not a lot. But when you uh, look at the beads that we had available us, for us in our initial 2017 study, nearly all of them were well, well under that weight. So, uh, we got around that problem. Actually, uh, the director of the, uh, um, the University of Wisconsin at Madison's uh, nuclear reactor lab, Dr. Uh, Robert Agassi, um, came up with a protocol for uh, some extended uh, count times and irradiation times in which we were able to uh, uh, handle samples that were significantly underweight. So. That was the first bit that helped. Now, the 2017 study, we did a small sample set of beads and I compared those to my existing database of uh, steatite raw material. And while initially they seemed to plot um, uh, where expected, uh, the results themselves, whoops, I don't have, yeah, there we go. Uh, the results themselves uh, were uh, in contrast to uh, what I was seeing in my raw material studies, in that a few, only a few of the beads seem to have uh, der been derived or been created from steatite uh, derived from northern Pakistan sources, while the large majority of them seemed to be coming from somewhere in Rajasthan, which was. Uh, possibly used as a source, but not as extensively as would be suggested by the results of our study. So it seemed, uh, something seemed to be amiss. And really, uh, um, what it came down to was something that was staring me right in the face, and I just didn't really uh, think too hard about it at first. But once we got these results back, I realized right away, the problem was um, the heating. Um, I was comparing our heat-treated beads uh, to a database of unheated raw material. Uh, as you can see from, uh, from these uh, results from heat treating experiments, the mineral talc, which is the major constituent of steatite, undergoes significant change when heated to high temperatures. And Harappans heated these beads to very high temperatures. Talc degrades into enstatite at over 900 degrees Celsius, into enstatite and cristobalite, a high temperature form of quartz, at temperatures approaching 1200 degrees. And, Harappan, and these Harappan beads were subjected to those temperatures. So the nature of the material, material while still uh, magnesium silicate, uh, was changed by heating. So what we needed to do was create a database made uh, of geologic materials um, uh, made uh, 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 that had been previously heated. So, 
the next one. Um, this is exactly what our did, we did. For the 2018-20 study, we, um, we heated a large set of samples, uh, of raw uh, uh, geologic samples that I had collected previously, but we subject, subjected these to uh, temperatures of 1200 degrees Celsius for one hour. And as you can see here, some changed white and others did not. You can almost tell which ones are from Northern Pakistan and which ones are not. But the uh, sample set uh, I chose was smaller than my raw material database. Uh, it included 155 geologic samples from 12 sources uh, in five regions, uh, Baluchistan, Northern, excuse me, misspelling here, Northern Pakistan, Jammu, Rajasthan, and Gujarat. We also uh, analyzed a larger set of beads. But uh, given my time limitations, I'm just going to be talking about today the beads from sites in Gujarat. All right. In our data set currently, we have uh, beads from five sites in Gujarat. Our uh, co-author, uh, Dr. Jeet Prasad from MS University Baroda provided beads from excava uh, MSU excavations in Lateshwar, Jagda, Bagasara, and Shikarpur. And our other collaborator, uh, uh, Dr. Pra uh, Prabod Savalkar from Deccan College, uh, generously gave us uh, a small set of beads from his excavations at Kutata Badli. So. We had those to look at. Now, here are here. Are, before we uh, subjected these to neutron activation, I actually uh, did X-ray uh, X-ray diffraction or XRD identification of the beads, <clears throat> just to confirm that they were indeed steatite and high fired, and they are all enstatite cristobalite. They're all high fired beads, with the exception of yeah. Uh, three of the beads from Kotada uh, Badli. These were actually not steatite at all. You couldn't tell from looking at them. They just appeared to be in a hand specimen, a small white, presumably steatite bead. But in fact, they were nontronite clay, um, uh, which was a locally available raw material. So I had to, we had to exclude those from the, obviously they're not steatite. We couldn't uh, look at those, but I'm going to talk about them uh, briefly at the very end of this talk. All right, so we got our, uh, uh, this, uh, these are the results of the, uh, the fired uh, geologic database, and it falls out much as before, much like the raw material database, into distinctive clusters uh, based on sources and regions. And when we plot the when we plot the uh, artifacts from Gujarat on top of those, they again tend to cluster uh, with certain regions. Now, this time, the predicted group membership or source of the majority of the uh, 11 beads that we looked at uh, were indeed um, seem to have been derived from a source in Northern Pakistan. So I think we've got the, um, the uh, issue of uh, uh, the discrepancy that we were seeing before in our earlier study. I think we've got that largely solved, although there are a few bugs that we still might have to work out. But the bees from Bagasara, Loteshwar, Karpur, Jekta, all appear to, be of, to have been made from steatite northern sources, which is what we're seeing with the raw material coming from the south as well. Whoops, this is not mine. Um, now, the one, uh, the one standout in this is the single bead from uh, Kotata Badli that was actually steatite. Um, it appears to be from a, um, um, a Rajasthani source, although um, it says uh, it's possibly Awar, but it could be somewhere in southern Rajasthan. It's not clear at this point. So that bead uh, in this small group stands out. Now, I said I'd come back to the um, uh, Kotata Badli beads, and I'm going to end at this point uh, shortly and hand uh, the discussion over to Brad Chase. But uh, Kotata, ba Kotata Badli of those sites was the one uh, Sora. Harappan site or Sorath site. 
So already something slightly different is going on there. But uh, this one odd, possibly regionally acquired steatite bead, along with the clay beads, seem to suggest that uh, they may be uh, involved in a quite different uh, acquisition pattern than the other uh, um, uh, Harappan sites around or fully Harappan sites. So I'm not sure why this, I don't know if you can see, I'm not sure why this stuff's appearing on screen. Anyway, at this point, I'm gonna hand it over to Brad, but before I do, I do want to uh, note that uh, this research going back 20 years up to the present day has been uh, generously funded and supported by numerous institutions, more of which I can't thank them all here, but I do wanna uh, thank uh, in particular um, um, uh, the Archaeological Survey of India and the uh, Department of uh, Archaeology uh, um, in, in Pakistan, um, Harpa, Harpa Archaeological Research Project, and of course our, our latest, uh, most of our most recent funding has come from uh, uh, Alpine College and we're extremely grateful. So at that point, I'll take questions later, I'll hand it over to Brad and he can hopefully uh, uh, make a little bit of uh, sense about Oh, so, well, I can try. Okay. Thank you, Randy. That was fantastic. Yeah. Um, and I, I was fussing with the technology as we all do at the very beginning. Um, did you tell everybody how new these results are? Like how long we've had to think about the, the newest results? Uh, how, how, how recently we've got them, you mean? Yeah. Uh, well, we uh, we actually started this in 2018, and the reactor lab went down for about a year and a half, and things got delayed. Uh, I got the results only about three weeks ago, about right. just about the time um, um, you know Rajesh uh, asked us to participate in this conference. And I thought, well, that will really spur me to look at the results <laughs> fast and get something out there. So, yeah, these are brand new, and uh, nothing's set in stone as it were right now and still <laughs> looking at the data <laughs> that's see inspired what there. but uh yeah it, they're all pretty recent so brand new farm fresh we like to say farm fresh <clears throat> so i'm going to step in here to part two uh as randy said this is something that we've been thinking about and talking about for a couple of years and it's all finally coming to fruition um and and what i take from randy's work is that this is complicated right we, we we've worked on this for a couple of years we've had to really work out the methodology to demonstrate uh that it's possible to source these beads geologically and now that we can we have to kind of ask ourselves the question um who cares and uh, what's 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 this all about why why does it matter uh that most uh, white steatite beads, it seems, uh, came from a very restricted set of sources in northern Pakistan. Uh, this is a the little image here in my title slide is an earlier version of of, of a map from Randy that shows the the, the overall trend in where uh, Harappan steatite is com comes from. So we are not thinking about this in a vacuum. We, we are not pretending to be the people that invented the question mark, as a, as, as a friend and colleague of ours says, um, but rather we're standing on the shoulders of giants. And I'm just going to show a couple quotes here from some of, uh, some of our mentors who have thought about this to a great extent and influenced the way that we think. Uh, the first one's Massimo Vidale, who points out that white steatite beads that I'm gonna to refer to in the text of my slides is WSB, just to save some pixels, um, is, you know, are perhaps the most distinctive and ubiquitous artifact of the integration era. Uh, that's, that's, that's something that Randy highlighted as well. And uh, that image there shows just a little, uh, a, a sort of a snapshot of some of the diversity of shape and size of these things from our 2017 study. Um, Heather Miller has worked a lot on the, the, uh, the Talcos uh, uh, industrial complex of the Indus civilization and, and tells us that the disc beads uh, are by far the most common type of bead everywhere and must have been made in the millions. That image there 
is an image of beads from the Mahenjo-Daro Museum that's gonna turn up in my presentation uh, a fair amount. Um, so just pay attention to it and you'll see it come up again and I'll return to it towards the end. Again, it shows a little bit, a sort of a snapshot of the diversity of shape and size of these things. But they're super, they're, they're really very standardized in comparison to other beads. They're all made of the same material. They have the same basic shape. The variation comes in width and thickness and, and, and weight. Um, this is just a snap. This is literally a snapshot of uh, beads from, um, from Bagasara, uh, from a project that I worked on with, with Ajit Prasad some years ago. And hard stone beads come in different sizes, different colors, different shapes, and there's just not as many of them at each individual site. Uh, so white and steatite beads are, are something special. There's something different. And their production was very restricted. So uh, the, the last sort of setup here is a quote from, from Mark Knoyer, who was the keynote at this conference, uh, telling us, suggesting that, that uh, that strings of steatite beads might have been used as a form of standardized exchange in addition to being worn as ornaments. And this was an idea that, you know, Mark uh, began, uh, this is I think the first in print that I, uh, that I can think of right now about 15 years ago, but having been Mark's student since the late nineties, I've been hearing and Randy and I have been thinking about this stuff for quite some time. Uh, this is a picture that Randy showed up here at the top of my slide of, of unfinished steatite bead blanks from Trench 54 at Harappa that had yet to be fired and turned white. Uh, down here are some steatite, or uh, yeah, steatite molds for faience tablets that uh, were also found in the same workshop area, and, and the whole area seems to have been involved with administration somehow, uh, as evidenced by the ceiling. And so, <clears throat> You know, Mark has gone on to suggest that it's not unlikely that standard lengths of strung microbeads may have been used in trade and exchange. Um, and, and, you know, the sort of this whole presentation and this whole project has been sort of a, a response to a question that I had one of the first times I heard Mark say this. And I said, like money? You mean steatite beads were like money? And you know, he said, no, I said the strings were used as trade and exchange. And, and so this got me thinking a couple of years ago to, to see if I could, I don't know, think a little bit more about this. And uh, I, I realized that it's really complicated to determine what is and is not money. This is a fairly recent uh, sort of summary of a really, what I found to be a surprisingly deep and complex literature trying to define something that we all take for granted every day. Um, and that's because cross-culturally, uh, people have used different materials for different purposes, uh, and the only thing seems to be common denominator, common denominator, got it, it's kind of funny, um, uh, denomination, uh, and the only common uh, factor is that it's a, it's a way to compare value. Um, so white steatite beads, they, they do share a lot of physical properties of money. Uh, this is a these little infographics here actually came from a website called visualcapitalist.com. It seems to be a source of uh, stock images to use in your in your PowerPoint presentations in business school. Um, and you know, money like think about pennies or or, or, or rupee coins or or paper money, right? Everyone is the same. They're they they they're, they're durable. They don't they don't fall apart. They're not like pigs or cows. Uh, they're portable. You can carry them around. They're, they're, they're pretty much uniform. There's a, they're valuable because they're limited in supply and everybody, everybody can use them and you can, and you can break them down into smaller parts. Beads fit the bill. White steatite beads in particular fit the bill really, really well. They're super durable. They're super portable. They're relatively uniform. They're definitely limited in supply, although there were a lot of them. Um, I don't know. We don't know how they were used so much. And I'm going to talk about that in a second. And uh, because we don't know so much about that, we don't know the extent to which they could be taken apart and put back together and used as individual pieces. So there's some questions. Um, <clears throat> You know, but this definition and this graphic having come from a uh, visualcapitalist.com, it, it, it's very um, it's very much in the present moment. It's very capitalist centric. Uh, some might even um, say it's 
it's a uh, Eura uh, Eurasian centric focused on a world uh, where where gold was the um, you know the, the 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 source of value par excellence for the, for uh, two thousand years. Um, but steatite has a lot of similar properties to gold. Both come from mines. Both are valued for apparently it would seem from what we understand to Harappan society and culture valued for their intrinsic properties of being of transformation and perhaps even color. Uh, both were used as ornaments and also maybe currency, um, but, and this is a, something that, that uh, I've been taken to task for in previous presentations, white stone beads are not coins. Coins are, are a viral technology of the seventh cent that began in the seventh century um, BC and allowed for folks like Alexander to pay his generals um, in something that was small and fungible and portable and durable, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, heads and tails. There's a huge literature about coins. Numismatics is a thing. And uh, white stone beads are not coins um, because steatite is stone. It is not metal. Uh, they could not be alloyed, which makes uh, uh, sourcing them geologically a lot easier. Uh, they were not uh, reclaimed during later periods. Um, they still exist. And I, I think that means that we can perhaps reconstruct the steatite economy um, in greater detail uh, than we possibly could if they, if, if uh, the Harappan's metal or the Harappan's unit value was made out of metal. So um, it's also good that, 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 uh, Steatite, white and steatite beads seem to have fallen out of use at the end of the industry of the uh, integration era. Um, kind of like uh, in, the, in the the world economy, no longer uses gold as a, as the as the standard unit of value for for monetary systems. So maybe they were kind of a little bit like gold after all, even if they weren't made out of metal. That's just a a, a thing I say sometimes. So I'm going to show some examples here of why we think this is really important and a really important thing to do, to, to source the beads, to reconstruct the, the, the circulation of these things. <clears throat> we all know where we're at. Uh, coming back down to Gujarat, this is the focus of our presentation today. Zoom in, uh, I'm going to show an example here from Shikarpur and Bagasara, uh, sites that were excavated by, by the team at uh, Maharaja Sayaji Rao University under the supervision of Dr. G. Prasad and Kuldeep Ban and Vian Sanawani and all of the great people there. Uh, tiny little sites. Uh, Bagasara is about a half an hectare and Shikarpur is about one hectare of, of, of walled area. Um, not, not big cities, small little places, manufacturing centers. Um, but holy moly, look how many what steatite beads there were there. Um, and these, uh, Bagasara, uh, 7,000, Shikarpur, some 4,000. Of course, this is a function of how many seasons of excavation occurred, how many trenches were opened. But having looked at this data six ways from Sunday uh, under the supervision of Dr. Ajit Prasad for years, I think that this is pretty accurate, uh, a reflection of, of, of Holy Moses, there's a lot of beads there. And um, they're everywhere. They're super ubiquitous uh, at both sites. Almost half the layers that have been excavated contain at least one steatite bead. And the median number, uh, that use a median instead of a mean there because it, 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 it isn't as uh, influenced by, by outliers like cat ashes which I'll get to in a second, but the median number of white steatite beads it, it, in the layers where they exist is 12 and seven. So, so not thousands, but small. What I understood from having worked with the material at Bagasara under the supervision of Ajit Prasad and others at MSU is that white steatite beads are just kind of sprinkled throughout the site. And that was my experience excavating with Mark at Harappa. And I think Randy would agree. Um, and if these steatite beads were actually made at Hazara, uh, or made with steatite from Hazara, then the site, the residents of these sites, uh, were regular participants in the steatite economy. And this is this is the 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 
the thought, the question, the hypothesis that, uh, that we wanted to, to evaluate when we began this study about three years ago. And now finally, it seems that uh, at least the ones that we've studied definitely were just as, we, uh, as was suspected based upon the properties of the stone. So this is super cool and super interesting. Um, but, you know, no amount of uh, instrumental neutron activation analysis can tell us how the things were used and what they meant for the folks back in the day. Um, and so, again, thank you, virtualcapitalist.com uh, for your Eurocentric and, uh, um, I don't know, capitalist-oriented uh, little infographic there. But uh, there's a huge literature on this and a huge uh, amount of theoretical debate that's gone on for literally 50 years about the distinctions between different types of money and different types of society. Um, has to do with uh, uh, theoretical positions called the substantivists and formalists and uh, whether or not uh, general purpose money existed before capitalism uh, in the 17th century. I, this is all something to get written about later, but the, it is kind of useful to think about general purpose money, something like rupees or dollars that can be used by, by anybody for anything. Um, and, 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 it, and I'm probably gonna shorthand that as money in the next couple slides. Uh, and to contrast that with social currencies, the types of things that uh, have been documented all throughout the world, um, most, and, uh, and, and, and were recognized as money by colonizers through, uh, wherever they went. They said, oh my gosh, the people here, wherever they used money just like we do. Um, but the thing is they didn't. Uh, in most situations, uh, what was recognized as so primitive money, I'm putting that in scare quotes, uh, both uh, in, on the slide here in my face, um, because I think it's a really gross term. But if you want to, to do research on this, it's a search term that has to be used because that's how the books were written mostly in the middle part of the 20th century, primitive monies, primitive monies. Um, and these were things that were used uh, in the context of social interaction uh, as, as bride uh, wealth and as dowry and as blood money. And as you know, um, you couldn't necessarily buy goats and cows with stuff that had, had a particular function in society. Um, but because it had all the physical properties of money, um, they, they were amenable to commercialization and the use as general purpose money in certain situations. And so the classic example of something like this from the colonial United States, and I don't wanna spend too, I don't wanna talk about it too long, but I looked at who all was logged on here and you might not know about this. These were beads made out of shell, either white shell or purple shell on the Eastern coast of the United States by, by, by one particular Native American community that controlled the source where the shells came from. They're not a widely distributed species. Um, these shells were used locally, they were used as ornaments, um, and then in the 17th century, when uh, white folks from Europe came to North America and started to colonize the place, they got involved with the, the they wanted uh, hides and furs from beavers and deer. And they traded the shells uh, from the East Coast to Native American communities inland who had demand for these things. And, they, and over the course of about 200 years, they developed into this, um, currency system. These here that are shown on this slide, are the, this is an example from the Musée Quiberly in Paris, because um, it's a fantastic work of art. It's from the Iroquois Native American community or uh, Haudenosaunee, as we would prefer to say now. Um, and they were used as, uh, they were put together in these belts that combined ornaments from all members of the community to express their will and were used to signify the legitimation of treaties. So, so they were used as ornaments uh, and had this social function like a primitive money or social currency, but they were also then broken down by colonists and used as like, like coins, like pennies, uh, especially in times when there was a shortage of, of, of metal currency. 
So they had the function of both the social currency and also a general purpose money at different times in different places. And uh, that leads me to think that, you know, we should, these things are not mutually exclusive, but they're both possibilities and ways that we need to think about this stuff back in the day, now that we can, now that we can geologically pro, uh, uh, provenience them. Um, so <clears throat> what we need to do is not only source the beads, figure out where the material came from and how they circulated in society, in, in this society, but also understand the context and association of where they were found at archeological sites to try to figure out how these things were used. So an example would be uh, to look at caches of which the, uh, there are, 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 are many. Um, and I'm gonna show some, an example, talk about a couple examples from Gujarat here. You know, you can cash coins in a piggy bank and you're gonna have a whole random assortment uh, of different denominations of coins. In, in, in the analogy with stereotype beads, we might see a, a pot with many different shapes and sizes because, you know, it didn't matter that they could be, it was, it was more important how much they weighed or how many there were uh, to be used in a general purpose way. On the other hand, uh, there's, it's, you know, you can cash jewelry uh, and then you have a, a, a much more restricted set of, of shapes and sizes and, and perhaps maybe even just one or two ornaments. And, and this might be a way to try to get at, a, a, at how these beads were being used in different times in different places and in different sites. So going back to the map here, we take a look at uh, Zekta, uh, which was excavated back in the 1970s by MSU. Um, published in 1988 there. And it is not a major city. It is not a manufacturing center like uh, Bagasara or Shikarpur were, but rather it seems to be a, a rural village where people lived in circular huts. And, in, and nearabouts there at that site is found this pot and this test tube contains the thousands of tiny little beads um, that are so uniform, it kind of looks like they probably came from a single ornament. Um, and if this was the case, then these beads were not being collected in this pot to be used one at a time to buy goats, but were rather part of an ornament that perhaps came to the site uh, as part of a large transaction or in the course of a social interaction, uh, you know, brought in by someone who married into the community or um, as, as, as a gift for an elder, something like that. Um, and you contrast that situation with Kanmer, which is more, uh, a, a, more like Bagasara Shikarpur, a fortified walled center that was involved with manufacturing and shipping. Um, and there, there's 11,000 in a single pot, 11,707. And they're all very uniform and it looks like they came from a single ornament, at least as far as this photograph portrays them probably produced at the same time on the same string and worn as a necklace or something. Um, but look, there's another 5,000 floating around the site. And I haven't, uh, you know, I haven't, haven't taken this all apart to find out how they're distributed like they are at Bugasar and Shikarpur. But if there's just a couple here and there, here and there, here and there, that's more like losing pennies or rupee coins. And so it makes me think that maybe at Conmer there's both things going on, which doesn't, isn't surprising. It's, it's about the larger patterns we expect to see in time and space. Um, Sirkotida, however, as an older site, demonstrates some of the challenges with this perspective. So there, is a, there are two major caches reported uh, by Joshi in, in the report. And then there's another 700 loose beads around the site. The loose beads are not recorded as to where they're located at all. And then this is the image that's published uh, alongside the, the, the text that says there's two large hashes. Uh, that looks more like it could be pennies and quarters and nickels and rupee coins in a jar, unless they were mixed. Dennis Frenis, so when he saw this, and I presented this at a conference, he looked at this and he's like, it looks like the two caches are mixed together, presuming that there were two, each one had a different set of sizes in it. And I cannot know that. All I had is a photograph. Um, and that's about as much documentation as steatite beads as Sarkotida as exists. Uh, Lotal is another very important site in Gujarat. And um, I haven't, you know, 
uh, mined uh, the report for every single mention of steatite beads, but I went through it pretty carefully. And, and uh, there's thousands in a jar. Uh, are they homogenous? Are they all different shapes and sizes? I don't know. How many are elsewhere at the site? How many are there at all at the site? I don't know because it, it was not recorded because they're tiny and there's a lot of them and it's a real pain in the butt to work with them. But there's just not a lot of information. And then there's the matter of uh, this, this is from Henjo Daro, the, the necklace that I started off with. It's totally misleading. I, 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 these were not all put together, all made at, these, at the same time. They were probably not worn as an ornament. They were probably put together from loose pieces that were found throughout the site by a museum curator and then strung up. And you know, if they were all found like this, it would indicate that strings of these things uh, were just like Mark Knoyer had said with one of, in one of the quotes that I started off with, you know, that these uh, could have been like a standardized unit of value. I'll take, you know, uh, five, five, th this thing costs five strings of steatite beads or whatever. But I don't think that's the case. And if that, and, and if these were in fact strung together from loose pieces found throughout the site, this is totally misleading, this object. So we can now reconstruct the circulation of these things. And, 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 and I, I hope Randy impressed upon you that this has been a complex, methodologically complex process to say that this is true, that we can do this. But um, we need to do a lot more, right? We need to see if the patterns that we're finding hold. We need to analyze uh, a lot more beads from more sites of more different shapes and sizes. And, and to see, you know, does it actually be, is it actually the case that, that the Surat type sites in Gujarat are, are, are partaking in a different circulation system than, than folks at the other large uh, walled sites? It's, it's an interesting hypothesis, but we can only evaluate that hypothesis if we have more bees from more sites. Um, and then given the inattention that has been paid to these objects by previous generations of researchers, there's a lot of ambiguity, ambiguity regarding the archeological context and association of these things. So we need to, as we undertake this uh, provenience study of beads, we need to uh, engage in a detailed study or restudy of the context and association of these things at the sites that we involve, that, that we're working with. And this is not a small matter. These, many of these sites were excavated a long time ago. And as we've seen, not pe the, the white steatite beads were not a major focus of attention in previous generations. So, you know, I'm, what I'm suggesting here could actually be multiple PhD dissertations, trying to find the things, going back through the things, reconstructing the stratigraphy of sites, uh, how many are found where, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This is big work and Rand, neither Randy nor I are in a, are in a position to, to, to write another PhD or multiple PhD dissertations. So at the end of the presentation, this is my last slide, we're looking for partners. Uh, to participate in a long-term program of study with the goal of reconstructing the steatite economy of the Indus civilization and all of its nuances. And so uh, now that we can met, now that we have the methodology nailed down and, and we've, we've thought through some of the things we're looking for partners, we'd like to, uh, we'd like to, if you're looking for a PhD dissertation, we, we, we might be able to help you. Uh, if you have beads that have been excavated by your institution and would like to, to, to know where they, the material came from, we, we might be able to help you. And uh, in, in doing so, we can build up a larger and larger database of, 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 uh, of analyzed beads, as well as the contextual and associational information that goes along with them. Thank you all very much.